Welcome everybody to this festival debate event. Who owns the truth and is it true? This will be a discussion about misinformation and disinformation in the media. We have three amazing guests tonight and I cannot wait for them to slice this topic. My name is Chiwa Chihana from Opus Independence and I will be chairing this event. So the event format for tonight will be a conversation between myself and the panelists and then it will be followed by a 30 minutes Q&A session at the end. Please start getting your questions ready ahead of that. Start with some safeguarding. The festival of debate operates on a no tolerance to language or behavior that is racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, or ableist, or oppressive to fellow audience members in any way. We ask that you're mindful of these things and respectful of others without the or throughout the proceedings. And finally, the festival of debate is pay what you feel because we wanted to make the events free at the point of access so there aren't any barriers for people to attend. We, however, rely on donations and would really welcome any donations to help us bring together these events. Um, we share ideas that can help shape our understanding of the world and really appreciate the support. So to support us, please donate at festivalofdebate.com forward slash donate. So without really taking much more time, I'm going to go straight on to Kerry Ann Mendoza from the Canary. Kerry Ann, how are you and welcome. Kerry Ann, you're muted. <laughs> All right, it was my turn. I got right in there straight away. <laughs> I was just saying, it's really great to see your face, Chiwi. We're normally only on Twitter together, so it's nice to have some uh, interaction. Absolutely. I'm excited to have you here. And I think you'd be best placed to tell me this. Um, so there's so much terminology like alternative facts, disinformation, misinformation out there. But how would you break it down for us, Kirian? Um, Well... I sort of look at the, the two topics that, that you asked me a question about were misinformation and disinformation and what is the difference between these two things <clears throat> and I was thinking about how best to characterize that and for me almost misinformation would be lying and disinformation would be gaslighting. If, you, if you're familiar with those two terms that, that's the kind of way I put it and I want to give people some examples so that they can kind of apply it to their daily life. So, for example, uh, in 2002, I went to um, a delegation to Israel-Palestine. And while I was there, Israel invaded. And this was just after rolling news broke. And so, just, you can't imagine what's happening. Tanks are barreling down streets. There are F-16s in the sky and they're bombing Ramallah. We we're based in Ramallah. Um, and the sky was like bright with the munitions. It was it was like waking up in the middle of saving Private Ryan. It was really intense. People were screaming. This whole thing was going on. And so we ran straight into the TV room, flicked on TV because we were like, this has got to be on the news. You know, this must be on the news. We flick, 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 and we get to the BBC News. <clears throat> and, a, and a correspondent based in Jerusalem comes on and says, it's a quiet night in Ramallah. Israeli forces have withdrawn to the gates of the city. So that's misinformation. If I'd been home, not there myself, seeing it with my own eyes, I would have been misinformed. Now, the disinformation on Israel-Palestine is much wider. It's things like completely neglecting the fact that there was a Nakba. There was a giant ethnic cleansing of Palestinian people from, from their land, from their businesses, from their actual homes. Um, the narrative that this is a conflict rather than a civil rights issue. So disinformation is a much bigger scheme by which people are, in essence, having an artificial reality created around them in order that the things that they see as possible, the things that they, are, they see as just or right, um, their emotional proximity to the, the actors involved in the situation are influenced in the interests of the people creating that artificial version of reality. And that's the situation that many of us are living with now, where we're way past misinformation, we're, we're, we're way past 
a lie here and a bit of you know spin um, over here. We're in a situation where we are living inside of a disinformation system where it is incredibly difficult for people who don't have the time or the inclination or the access um, or the skills even to be able to pick through and identify these systems of disinformation and make themselves safe in terms of knowing um, what they can trust, what is happening, what happened and what's likely to happen next and how they can influence those events. Right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, um, Carrie Ann. So I think my takeaway is the lying and the gaslighting. And I think from there, yeah. you just yeah, build that understanding. Thanks a lot for that. Um, Michael, Michael is from Bywire News. Um, Michael, how are you tonight? I'm good, too. Well, how are you? I'm doing all right. Thanks. Uh, is the truth owned in your view? And if so, how does one own or perhaps claim the truth? Um, well, I think that's a really great question. Um, and I think so much of the work we do in news and in science and in poetry stems from this notion um, of what is truth and, 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 and can truth be mediated and, and manipulated. Um, and I think really it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, so I'm going to try and come at it from a slightly different perspective. Um, the way I think about it, um, the way I like to look at it is that I think truth is really based around, you know, our shared vocabulary and our shared language. And when we have a breakdown of those, um, then the essence of truth itself becomes vulnerable um, and then society becomes vulnerable as a whole. And that's uh, that's extremely dangerous. So the way I want to talk about tonight is looking at sort of words, numbers and language as a sort of generative force rather than just a descriptive force. So. Why do words create an emotional or a physical response? And like, what does that mean to us as humans, right? So this is the area I find quite interesting. And I think everything stems around that. So like, why do we use words? Well, we use words as a way to tile the landscape of our realities or, or, or to um, describe our own realities. Um, and that was a phrase coined by Jason Silver, and I, I think that's powerful. So we take our words and we use them to, to tile the landscape of our reality, to, to describe who we are. Um, but that is like channeled in our perspective of, of events, of what we see. Um, so if you think about the astronaut's perspective, for example, when an astronaut leaves the Earth's um, atmosphere and, and, and heads to space, um, they have a different set of reality. Uh, they have a new set of truths, if you like. So they have a, you know, a horizon that's, a, that's never punctured. Um, planets and, er and everything else, the whole solar system. So when they look at that, the, the, the trivial nature of our existence on Earth is somewhat diminished. And that perception then changes their entire viewpoint of, of the world. So, so as a concept, truth is difficult to explain because there's an endless supply of it, right? There's an endless supply of truth. There's an endless supply of the perception of truth. And there's a the supply of empirical and anecdotal truth. Um, therefore, I think the way to approach it is to define truth in maybe in two separate categories. The first category would be like a scientific truth. Uh, and the second truth would be a poetic truth. Um, and I, I wrote down a, a quote that I think sums this up really well. It's a quote by Ursula Le Guin. Um, and she says, science describes accurately from the outside and poetry describes accurately from the inside. Science explicitates where poetry implicates. And I think that's right. So the question then is, where does new sit? Is new scientific truth or is it poetic truth? And I think this is where things get tricky because news is both, right? It's, it, news, news is a, should be a dispassionate reporting uh, of an event that occurred recently. But that is an impossible outcome for a human being. So a human being's perception of reality is mediated by their experiences, whether that's nurture, nature, or in that moment. So the person, therefore, telling the story or reporting on the news, their version of events is always going to be different than someone else's because of their mediated version of reality. So I find, I find, I find that, that element of, of truth really interesting because we always talk about an absolute truth. Well, truth can never be an absolute. It has to be based upon um, an individual's uh, experiences. Um, and, the, you know, 
when a reporter is is explaining this information, like they are influenced by their surroundings, but they're also influenced by the expectations of their editors oh. and also the expectation of the audience. Um, yeah. and, and people don't really factor that in. And I think that's a bit of a problem. Um, so I think you can't really have a un, you can't really have a news story that's truly unbiased. You can't really have a news provider that's truly unbiased. But that's okay. I think the real problem is when we start breaking down our shared language and our shared truth. And, and I'll just I'll wrap a little bit because I've, I've been <laughs> rabbiting on. Um, but the um, I think the prime example of this would be the term fake news, right? Everyone associates fake news with Donald Donald Trump, but fake news was a a, a term originally coined by um, First Draft News around 2013, 2014. Um, and First Draft News was owned by Eric Schmidt, who was the chair of Google. Um, and he was funding Hillary, Cl Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign at the time to you know, tens of millions of dollars. Um, and he set up this, this First Draft News organization to call out fake news uh, from the conservatives' side. However, Donald Trump took that term and denigrated it so much that those two words in that order, fake news, no longer mean an untrue news story. They now uh, mean that you do not you do not agree with the news reporting. Therefore, you do not trust the source of the news reporter, largely because it's on the opposite side of the political argument. Now, we are making our determination of truth based upon which political preference we have. And that is not how news works. That is not how truth works. And that has been done for short term game. All right, thank you. So that actually dovetails really well into what I was going to be asking Matt. Uh, so Matt Kennard is from De Declassified UK. Um, Matt, welcome to tonight's session. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. Um, just, just from what Michael was saying, I have a question for you around the misuse of truth. Um, so how is the misuse of truth used to speak about national security? Just because I think Michael touched a little bit on that. Um, well, what we've seen in kind of, I guess since Trump really has accelerated massively is this use of a fight or a stated fight against disinformation and misinformation waged by the West against Russia primarily, but also now China, you're seeing. And this has this started from the national security state, uh, which has a long, long time ago designated Russia the primary threat. Um, and the state and the, the mainstream media generally follows the state uh, in its reporting priorities. Um, and, and, and since Trump and then Brexit, you've had a liberal elite that have just massively disorientated because they they lost um, and rather than um, look in the mirror and understand that this liberal elite oversaw 30 years of neoliberalism which gutted society and, and led people to be desperate enough to vote for Trump and Brexit, they projected their own failures onto Russia because it was an easy get out and you saw that in America, I mean with Trump it was bananas, it got to the, the stage where it was just literal lies being printed every day <clears throat> in the US mainstream US media saying Russia and Putin were responsible for every single ailment the US had ever suffered. Um, and then with Brexit, we kind of saw it happening here. And both got shot out of the water. One first with the Mueller report um, and then with the Russia report. The Mueller report obviously found no ev evidence of collusion, which, uh, which was kind of buried as a finding by the liberal media. And then... The Russia report, which was um, uh, which was published by the the committee that covers intelligence in, in Parliament, that found that there was no uh, evidence that Russia had had any influence on the Brexit vote. But that didn't matter. That there was years of disinformation being pumped out by the liberal media about Russia causing Trump causing Brexit, and in fact now those same liberal journalists or liberal institutions have, have jumped on the back of the new national security state's new fight against Russia, even, even though all the, these conspiracy theories have been disproven. And it's, it's clever in a way. I mean, it's, I think it's Orwellian because what you have now is uh, a liberal elite in tandem with the national security state um, pushing this idea that we're at war with Russian disinformation while at the same time being the major agents of disinformation in our society. Uh, and, and when I say that, we live steeped in disinformation and misinformation because we live in a, a society where all the means of communicating with the population 
are in the hands of, of very rich, uh, very powerful corporations. And they are set up on the profit motive. They're not set up as news, uh, as disseminators of information for an informed public. And this is a, a, mis this is a, a, a misunderstanding that many, many people have. They, they, they believe this kind of fairy tale that you're taught in civics class, um, which is that there's a noble um, media that holds power to account. It's a fourth estate, all this democratic theory. It's, it's essentially all rubbish. How our mainstream media operates across the board, and there are no exceptions. I include the Mirror, the Guardian, the BBC in this. Um, they all act 95% of the time as arms of the state. Um, there might be little um, stories they do which expose elements of the establishment, but all the narratives which emanate from the national security state and emanate from the British establishment are mirrored in our media. And they're all conspiracy theories and they're all disinformation. One of the major ones, which I think is one of the most popularly believed um, conspiracy theories, and in fact, you can't work in the mainstream media unless you believe this conspiracy theory, is that the US and the UK, one of their goals in their foreign policy is the spread of freedom and democracy. Mm. Now, that is, I mean, a five-year-old could deconstruct that if you put a little bit of evidence because, and, if, and for me, it's even more ridiculous than religion. I'm an atheist because at least with the religion, right, the problem is there's a lack of evidence, but there's not evidence to the contrary. Uh, whereas in, in the case of American and British exceptionalism, this idea that we are different to all empires and, and we want to spread freedom and democracy, every, nearly every bit of evidence points to the opposite of the theory itself. But it doesn't matter because this is, a, this is a theory and this is a narrative which is put out by the national security state and is amplified by the media. And in fact, every, every person who we think of as sophisticated, every Guardian columnist, every Financial Times columnist, every BBC presenter effectively has to believe this lie and it's disinformation. Um, so I think the whole edifice is, is, is corrupt uh, and wrong. Um, and I think that the only way we get around that is to create independent media because independent media is not in thrall to power systems that operate. And it's not just the state, it's also corporate. Well, they're the major two uh, powerful forces in our society. And hopefully, independent media can avoid the, the falling into the trap of, of doing their bidding. What's quite interesting, and I've noticed, and I don't want to name any names, but you see the same system working on alternative media as well. You see certain alternative outlets get closer and closer to power and more and more assimilate their talking points and assimilate their narratives into their reporting uh, and their discussions and their discourse. Um, and that, I think that's a trend we're going to see because... One of the things about Britain is it's quite a nascent sector, the independent media sector, and um, the establishment is grappling with what to do about it because they control the narrative in the mainstream media and alternative media providing contradictory information, truthful information, which which mm. punches their their propaganda is a threat. Now, my, my belief that, is... Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, just, just, uh, just from where you are... Um, then in what way then would you say your platform is actually exposing or combating uh, misinformation in, in this case? Uh, you know what? Just... It's funny with what we do because w what we do is just do standard reporting, but no one else is doing it. And that is a sign of how corrupt the mainstream media is. We just like, for example, my colleague, Phil Miller, who's, in my opinion, the top investigative reporter in the country, especially on foreign policy, national security issues. He did a story recently about a, um, a privy council of a, an elite British cabal. So lords, heads of MI6, um, uh, prominent financiers. They, uh, they, they, have, they form a privy council that every year flies to Oman to advise the, that, the dictator who rules in Oman and, and was actually installed by the SAS. Um, that, uh, that, that came out in Alan Duncan, the, the, the foreign minister's diaries recently. Not one newspaper picked that up. It was just lying there. So what we do is we, we challenge power, whereas what the media does is it, 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 it disseminates their talking points and then distracts the population 
by every now and then coming up with these scandals like I don't know Boris Johnson's curtains, right? It might it, it definitely it's an it's an important story. It's interesting, but it's about the priorities that are given. Not one newspaper has printed the fact that there are a, a cabal of British elite politicians is advising a Gulf dictator every year in what is called a privy council. Not one newspaper has reported that. That's a systemic problem that really shines a light on how our establishment works. What is much better is to distract the population by thinking we have a free press, by just concentrating on these personality-based um, tittle-tattle, really. And, and as I say, I'm not uh, definitely corruption stories about Boris Johnson are... are, uh, are, are a fair game but it's about the priorities you literally yeah. don't see these more systemic stories in the newspapers another example we just mm -hmm. i'll finish with this we okay. i worked with phil on a story recently <clears throat> about how mi5 and mi6 the two security services ex external and, and domestic mm -hmm. were training senior spies from saudi arabia egypt and the uae uh three of the most repressive dictatorships in the world not one, and this was after Khashoggi was killed. This was after the Egyptian security services allegedly, but everyone thinks they did, killed that Italian PhD student. So they were. So our security services are training some of the worst monsters in the world. Not one newspaper. That this has never been written about before. This was a revelation that declassified published. Not one newspaper covered that in the whole of Britain. Uh, where uh, whereas. They cover every uh, uh, the distract the tools of distraction, uh, stories of distraction. They cover endlessly. So there's a massive priority, and and it's often called censorship by omission, right? It's not active disinformation if you're not publishing it, but by not providing the context that people need to understand society in a truthful way, you are in a way misinforming people because you're not allowing them to come to to see all the evidence that would allow them to understand their society. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Matt. And I think that probably um, also speaks to uh, the current COVID crisis and PPE scandal. Um, Kerry Ann, if you come on, uh, you have been doing some work around investigating the scandals around PPE. Could you just talk a little bit about that and what your findings have been? Yeah, I think, could I just broaden it a little bit? Because I think what Matt, yeah. I'd love to piggyback off, off what Matt just said, because it is enormously yeah. important. Mm -hmm. um, there is so much, I mean, I always have it as if you imagine the establishment media has just shrunk the arena of debate to like this big. And yet there is all this other stuff that we need to be talking about around the edges. And what I see is independent media outlets tackling all of that stuff outside the edges. And it might be that you have an outlet, um, you know, like classified, which is focusing on foreign policy, national security, the, these types of things. And that's their bread and butter. Um, and what we've tried to do at the Canary is create a kind of all purpose outlet so that we can, you know, run investigations. We can look at media analysis and we're trying to do a bit of everything as much as as much as we can. And what really stunned me was how effective we are at doing that on the tiny little budgets that we're operating under, under quite serious threat, <laughs> you know, whether it's character assassination, they're trying to shut down our businesses, they're trying to, you know, create reputational, you know, damage, and all of this stuff. And it just makes me so angry. I think I'm probably angrier now at that behavior in the establishment media than I even was before we actually established the Canary. Because it made me realize, hang on, if like 20 journalists in this little outlet that is running on like a quarter of a million pounds a year is able to do this much, what the hell are all of these people in London doing? Like what on these massive salaries in these gorgeous buildings? And the answer is they're just churning out what they're there to churn out, you know, 99% of which is disinformation. I just want to touch on a couple of things because, you know, like Matt, it, these are stories that deserve the time of day. So we have a fantastic investigative journalist um, called John McAvoy. He discovered through, through you know, a, a, a not, not necessarily an investigation that most of us could have conducted, but it didn't take a million pounds to do it. You just needed to be smart to know who to ask and how to get hold of the information. He discovered an entire reconstruction unit inside the foreign office of the United Kingdom, literally devoted to the overthrow of the Venezuelan government. 
you know, just just runs the actual proof written down. So we were able to publish it. You know, the Venezuelan government was then able to pick it up and actually make formal responses to the United Kingdom. And this is this is fact. You know, this wasn't then disputed as, as nonsense. This is fact. Where was the establishment media on that? If they're supposed to care about democracy and freedom and fair elections and sovereignty and all of these buzzwords that they constantly seem to be throwing in our direction, where were they on this? And so it starts with big stuff like that, but it, it comes all the way down to, to, to things that are more localised. And so um, we've got a writer called Tom Anderson who has done some fantastic work just in this last fortnight of actually breaking exclusives from prisons. And some of those have been COVID related and they're the circumstances in which prisoners are, are enduring this, this pandemic, which are frankly inhumane and evil. Um, but also a black Muslim prisoner, Dwayne Fulgens, beaten within an inch of his life, left without proper medical care. You know, no one's talking about it. So you have people here who can tell you who George Floyd is because that's happening in the States. So it's OK for us to know about George Floyd because no one here can do anything about George Floyd. But who's Dwayne Fulgens? And nobody knows because we're not having that discussion because that would mean that people would actually want to start taking action here and that would threaten the situation here. And that brings us to PP where you have, you know, a global pandemic that has killed more than 100,000 people in the, in the UK, which it didn't need to kill. Like those people actually did not need to die. They have died because of negligence and corruption and frankly, a base apathy to their very existence. I mean, you, you know, we don't even have a government in this country anymore, I would argue. We just have a sort of cartel that are running things that very much in their own interests. And while nurses and doctors and delivery workers and transport workers and cleaners and train managers and all of these people who, who live, frankly, on pittance, they're living in, in wages that leave them precarious in a lot in a lot of cases, are out there risking their lives to save other people. Our government was WhatsApping with its mates to find out how they could make more COVID billionaires, how millionaires could become billionaires, how they could leverage their friendships with the government to get tax breaks or, you know, get a contract. Never mind, they've never delivered anything like this in their lives. That doesn't matter. It was just about this wealth transfer. And I think, you know, a lot of us, you know, you're always running a story at a time in, in the press. Mm. That's how it is. You know, you're right. It's a story at a time, a story at a time. But when you start putting all these stories together, what you see is that the world as it is, as it really is right now, the country of the United Kingdom, the four nations of the United Kingdom, as it stands now, um, to term it a liberal democracy, it's, it's a joke. You know, and it's not even a funny one. It's it's clearly moving into oligarchy. And, and I know there would be people even harder than me that would say it's been an oligarchy for 30 years. And so you start having to ask yourself, how do you bring people into this conversation? Because when the reality is so far from the projected reality, that is why I think a lot of independent media comes up against this, oh, you're conspiracy theorists. Because what people want to hear is um, things are not quite as they seem. You know, there are some good things, there are some bad things, and you know, if and we can make some reforms and we can get this thing back on the road because that's more palatable, it's it sounds moderate, it sounds objective, <laughs> but it's simply not true. And I think the most responsible thing that we can do as journalists at the moment is ring the alarm bell, is to say to people, you are in danger now. We are in danger. You know, we are losing our civil liberties, our most basic and fundamental rights. People are dying in frankly terrifying numbers. If you look at how many sick and disabled people have died since 2010, just mm. from health and social care policy, it's terrifying. So 
you kind of have to work with what you've got, but it does mean a lot of the time, you know, if you're dealing with people who are immersed in that projected artificial reality, you know, you have to sometimes bring them over slowly. And that might be they care about this one issue and they start reading you on that issue and then they kind of break in and they expand. Because I know, you know, there'll be some of us who have been radicals forever. And so this is something that they don't really think about, the journey out of a fake reality into, you know, a world where it more closely resembles the truth. Um, but that's not an easy journey to take. And I think it is something that preoccupies me as, you know, as an editor of an outlet is, you know, how do I take people on that journey responsibly um, and, and compassionately? So perhaps I, mean, I think you and Matt raise very important points, and maybe maybe we could get an answer, maybe or a direction at least from Michael um, on, on, on on what the role of new technologies is at, at the moment. Is there anything you can say about that, Michael? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I could talk all night about that, but obviously I, I won't do that. Don't worry. Um, so I think, I mean. For me, accountability is at the heart of um, truth or fake news. Um, we saw in 2016, you know, there was more fake news shared across social media than there was real news shared across social media. Um, and that's terrifying. Um, the problem hasn't got any better. It has just got uh, the, the purveyors of the problem have got better at hiding the problem. Uh, and they're far more effective. So, I mean, most people don't realize that the mobile phone that they use every single day is basically a slot machine. It has all the same output as a slot machine. Every time you swipe your, your phone for notifications and updates, that phone is recording your actions. It's recording your reactions to it. And if you ignore it, it ups the ante and tries to grab your attention even further. Um, so when you've got these weaponized grades um, hyper-targeting, targeting individuals through social media, well, they can manipulate entire populations, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the bad side of technology. Um, and, and they're often faceless, right? So a corporation... <laughs> So a corporation could buy ads that are, have the ability to influence an entire population, right? Uh, and there's no recourse and there's no requirements of who they are or why they should do that. There's a little bit with uh, around political advertising um, with imprints, but very, very little. So how do we solve this? Well, we need to have accountability at the heart of who we are. On Facebook or Twitter, you can create a million different profiles and you can gain those responses. You can, you know, we know Saudi Arabia use uh, their own Twitter farms, um, which they call flies, um, and they, they suppress free thoughts in Saudi Arabia massively. Um, but they're not accountable. They are anonymous bots. Well, not even bots. They're just anonymous people who are paid to sit in a data center and spew government propaganda. Um, now, because they're not accountable, because they're totally anonymous, then when individuals go against the government in Saudi Arabia, they get, they get that, whole, um, that whole swarm of flies attacking them effectively. And it gives them the false perception that everyone is against them. Um, so putting accountability back in the heart of everything we do is the key to solving this problem. So with Bywire, any journalist, publisher or creator, just like in real life, gets one life. They get one reputation and that reputation should be guarded. Any self-respecting journalist will have absolutely no problem at all with the world knowing who they are and what their opinions are. You can see that with the fantastic work of Carrie Ann and Matt alone. Um, so once we have true accountability and once there are... Um, the, what's the consequences for people's actions, then people will think twice about how they publicize things. So I think that's one way to solve yes. um, disinformation. And on, on Byway News, we have a bounty system so people can actually challenge uh, publishers and creators. They can push back and say, I don't agree with this. This isn't right um, for this reason. And if they are proven to be right, then we'll give them a financial reward from that because we want to make our platform as good as possible. Not only that, our our um, partners and our readers are incentivized to make the platform the best they can. So they highlight things that go wrong or they highlight something that might be incorrect. And what we can do, we can, we can talk to these publishers, we can educate them, we can, and we can warn them if they persistently produce fake news and disinformation, we can admonish them. Um, and ultimately, if they continually produce fake information, well, then we should remove them from our platform. By why it needs is a, is a, is a Web 3.0 technology. Web 3.0 is all about putting trust back into products, putting trust back into the digital sphere. And that's what we want to do. 
But trust comes at the price, and that price is accountability. But what we do with Bywire is we have a democratic oversight. So with YouTube or Facebook, you might log in one day, your account is gone. That would never happen on Bywire. That's completely wrong. We've seen journalists, activists losing their uh, access to Facebook and, and access to Twitter. Sometimes that's their only way to, to get information out. Um, so with Bioware, we have a democratic process. Um, but more than that, all of our content is stored on a decentralized blockchain. Okay, so that means that there can't be censorship. There can't be uh, there can't be censorship from hostile governments. There can't be a rewriting of history by corporations because corporations often buy news companies. They remove old news and they just re-edit it. That is completely wrong, and that adds to that breakdown of um, a shared language and a shared truth, and it adds to the distrust within news, and it adds to that that disconnect of um, of, of trusting the fourth estate, if you like. Um, so I think technology is at the heart of how we solve these problems. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Before before you turn away, you look like you're going away, Michael. Um, so in that case, then, what, uh, is it important then for media literacy to be brought into the space? Because I think we talk to each other, but what about media literacy? What's its space in there? What's its place in this space? I mean, sure. I think media literacy is important. Um, but I think ultimately the vast majority of people aren't going to want to spend any time improving their media literacy. I think we need to be able to, I don't think we need to teach people to spot fake news, although that's not a bad thing anyway. I think we need to make fake news a historical element. I think we need to use these things like by wire news. And I think we need to use independent news um, to put that accountability back into the heart of who we are. And I think that's a much stronger way for us to position ourselves. Right, thank you. And Matt, do you feel the same way as well about media literacy? Do you have any thoughts? Uh, you know what? I think we need to just reformulate. Can you see me? Yeah, yeah, uh, we can. Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, I think we should need to reformulate the whole debate because we this 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 debate is 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 wrong in the sense that the biggest agents of disinformation and misinformation in our society are the mainstream media. Number one. Number two. Fake news is not new. These media institutions have been pumping out propaganda since they were conceived. That is basically their role in a democratic society. When things get out of hand, like the Pentagon Papers or Assange, the, the, the people go to prison or they try to put people in prison. So the, the, the media system works for the elites in the West. We have a free press, but they allow people to write what they want because they like what they write, if you see what I mean. So I think we need to reformulate this idea. Like think about, for example, the Vietnam War, Gulf of Tonkin, uh, which in 1964, which was an incident, uh, a purported incident where North Vietnam had attacked a US um, warship. That was reported in all the US media as a, a fact. And it generated uh, the pretext to, for the US to basically escalate to, to a full blown war in Vietnam with all the, the horrific consequences of that. That was disinformation put out by the mainstream media in 1964. And then you have it through the whole of the 20th century in the US and the UK media. So we need to basically laugh at the um, people like the Foreign Office or the State Department who say they're, they're, they're fighting Russian disinformation because we they are the generators in alliance with their media partners of disinformation and misinformation in a society. Secondly, I'd like to just go back to a uh, little bit to what Kerry Ann said because yeah, I think Kerry Ann is a, 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 a heroic figure in in independent media for reasons she outlined, which is that they the Canary is quite an interesting case study of what happens or what they try what they and maybe a, a, a premonition of what 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 they will, they will do to the rest of us in alternative media because the Canary has been the subject of definitely the most ferocious attacks by the establishment in terms of independent media. And there's one reason for that. They're popular and they have an effect. And that is the scariest thing for the establishment media, number one, and the establishment, because they control the narrative because they control the mainstream media. If you have popular outlets that uh, can reach a lot of people that are giving alternative facts or actually just giving the real facts, then that's a massive problem. And what, ha what, what I believe they will do now, because they can't argue with the facts themselves, is they turn to reputational destruction. So they want people to not believe anything they read on the pages of that website or in the pages of that uh, publication. Uh, and it's quite effective 
And that's why you see so many resources put into destroying the canary. And as Kerry Ann said, that's been trying to get people to uh, withdraw their advertising to destroy their business model. It's uh, trying to destroy their reputation for ha for factual rigor. Uh, and and what's quite funny to me is that you have all these newspapers. For example, recent a very recent case is the CIA put out that that bullshit story about Russia offering bounties. <clears throat> to the Taliban to kill US and UK troops. They've subsequently, they've said a couple of weeks ago, this was all complete rubbish, but was reported across the media, the Guardian, the New York Times, Washington Post, the Telegraph, whoever it was, they all reported it as fact. No one, th there's no comeuppance for that. No one even, uh, the, the Guardian, even their headline didn't even say the CIA says, it just had it as reported as fact. That's, that, that does, that, as Harold Pinter said, that never happened, it doesn't matter. They are establishments, so they don't get any kind of scrutiny. Whereas the canary, when they make a mistake, which of course they do, because every media institution makes a mistake at some point, um, especially when you put out as much as they do, everyone is piling on them. Every single like uh, agent of this of this system is 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 piling in and saying, "Look at this! This is a conspiracy theory. This they got this fact wrong." And that the reason for that massive disproportionate response is because mm -hmm. canary pose a threat to. To, to the to the existing media order, uh, and they're popular. Now that will happen to the rest of us as we get more popular, as we reach more people. But I think that the, the way to 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 th that we get around that is to show solidarity at all times. And actually, you see that 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 not a lot of people understand that yet, or especially people within the mainstream. I mean, for one one example was when Jeremy Corbyn gave an interview to the Canary. Owen Jones, who is report, uh, who's, who claims to be a supporter of independent media, had a go at Corbyn for how, for going on the Canary because he'd imbibed all this bullshit propaganda from the establishment about trying to destroy the Canary. That he he, he thought he was doing the right thing to say that. Now that's, I mean, uh, that, that that's ridiculous in my opinion and morally uh, questionable. But um, I think that uh, alternative media is at the start in the UK. And we are at the front line of fighting disinformation. And, and that disinformation comes mm -hmm. from the establishment. It doesn't yeah. come, I mean, of course, there's a, there's there's Russian influence operations as we have operations elsewhere. There's troll armies. As well. But if you think about the impact of those compared to the infrastructure of propaganda that exists in our society in terms of the corporate media, the think tanks, et cetera, it's probably like one or 2% of the Russian stuff. And they want us to focus on that for a reason because it takes, the focus off them. Yeah, Matt, I think I think it's uh, it's quite key that I bring uh, Kerry Ann back in because you you have highlighted issues around solidarity as well, um, uh, and I think that that's quite important, especially for growing media. But Kerry Ann, what has been the benefit of solidarity at all, if any, uh, with in terms of where the canary stands and obviously all the attacks that you get? Is there any benefit to it, or how does that oh work? Oh my God, it, it's enormous. I mean, it's. I mean, just thank you, Matt, for what you said. Um, it means the absolute world um, to have the solidarity of other outlets, especially when they're journalists that you respect. You know, because you know these are people who are, you know, they're not grifters, they're not columnists who just sort of come in and <laughs> do a theatrical thing. These are hardworking. Um, you know, I would almost call them old-fashioned journalists. You know, it's, I think it, um, the thing that gets me most is I think the independent media is populated, is chock full of the journalist that lives, I think, in my imagination. You know, when I imagine being a journalist, um, I'm surrounded by those people now. You know, people that are here, they see it as a public service. It's not like, you know, a career which they could have chosen from because they were born into it. So they could go, hmm, should I be an accountant, a lawyer, a politician or a journalist? Um, you know, it, these are people who opt often have been directly impacted by the, the subject matter of their journalism. You know, they might be from a marginalised community or an activist community, or they've, you know, been a, a social worker and realised that they had to find another way of dealing with these problems because the same problem kept walking through the door and they felt like I can't just keep sitting here unable to solve this problem I'm gonna have to find another way to 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 fight it and and that in itself like that very attitude is an act of solidarity 
you know it's it's bigger than you um it, it's it's saying i need to find a way to be of service in this world and this is a way that i can be of, of service in this world and you know one of the most painful experiences that i had you know, in that first couple of years of the canary was having people that i knew for a fact knew where my heart was they knew what the canary is they knew that they were lying they knew that they were lying for an, for a result for a political result that they they were lying and they did it anyway while accusing me of fake news <laughs> and accusing the canary of fake news and there's always nothing more infuriating than yeah. someone lying that you're a liar um and mm -hmm. and so you know um, and we sort of found out really quickly that sort of and thankfully we kind of predicted this in advance we you know even a year you know it took a year for us to even set up the carry from the sort of initial conversations to mm -hmm. to day one and through that time you know we did our risk assessments and we were kind of like you know where do we think the biggest you know risks are going to be and we predicted fairly accurately we would probably have more kickback um, from mm -hmm. from the sort of liberal left than, than we even would from the hard right. And that was because we would be out progressiving them. <laughs> you know, we would be actually holding people to account from the left, um, which liberals hate. I mean, it challenges their whole sense of themselves. Um, and so their their response is quite violent, it's quite vicious, and it's universal. Um, yeah. So to, to have that many, you know, organizations and individuals and news programs and all this stuff just kind of gunning on your tiny little ship, um, you know, mm -hmm. is, is scary. We're all only human inside that ship. You know, we're trying to get yeah. through this storm while doing mm -hmm. our job. That's the thing. You know, that's not even our job to deal with all that stuff. Our job is the journalism. This is on top of the day job. Um, yeah. And so the solidarity was important for two reasons. One, it meant that um, there is still a canary you know, because they killed our initial business model. So we had to create a new business model based on subscriptions overnight. You know, we just had to completely U-turn, which we were happy about because we wanted to get to a subscription income. We never really liked the advertising anyway, but we figured we would be able to do that over time. And we needed to, you know, turn that ship around fast. And because there were people, you know, across you know, new new left media, this independent journalism that people respected, you know, people like John Pilger, people like Norman Finkelstein, you know, people like this, Noam Chomsky, you know, saying, this outlet's great. This outlet is just doing its job. Like, why is everyone hating on this outlet? Yeah. And that meant the world because it meant that normal people felt like they could trust us. It gave them no, another voice to listen to that they could respect. And, and I appreciate everyone who lended their credibility to us for that for that period of time but the other yeah. thing is mental yeah. health you know can you imagine what it's like for these journalists who you know are, you know some of them are early in their career some of them have had 30 40 year careers um but you know they're they're not you know people who who are limelight seeking attention seeking kind of people you know most journalists are introverted you know and they're, they're yeah. used to kind of doing their getting on the things i suppose yeah yeah yeah, yeah and yeah. all of a sudden you know you've got all this noise around you and people attacking you personally so it helped on two fronts it was it was a literal practical support in terms of helping us change our business model and just survive and yeah. it Come actually on. really helped mental health wise yeah, uh, Carrie Ann, uh, so just to let everybody else, to remind everybody, we are taking questions. So, whatever platform it is that you're on right now, uh, put your questions in the comments, and we've got a team that will bring them to the to, to the panelists. Uh, before we get into the QA bit, there's something that you all seem to be alluding to, and I don't think I've asked this question. I would really like to hear from you. Do you think, therefore, especially in the spirit of solidarity, do you think, therefore, that um, misinformation disinformation affects uh different groups disproportionately absolutely yeah, yeah. go ahead I think, I'll, I'll go very quickly because i'm conscious i've spoken for a bit so i'll give way to these lovely chats in a, in a second um but yeah it does affect groups differently because your ability to respond 
to false allegations, to lies, to misinformation, those things, differs greatly based on your wealth, your class, your connections, all of these things. I can remember a while ago saying someone was talking about, um, you know, there are a lot, there's this whole cancel culture nonsense, you know, kind of going on at the moment. It's basically a bunch of kind of affluent, older white guys, um, you know, complaining that they can't be sexist or racist or ableist like they used to with like dealing with any consequences. And they're calling that cancel culture. Like it's an act of oppression that they can't do this. Um, and I was just like, literally it's throughout history in this country there has always been freedom of speech for rich white men like because they bought it that's not the issue that, that we're dealing with we're trying to expand the franchise of freedom of speech to other groups who don't happen to have um those privileges to fall back on and they are responding to that as if it is an act of oppression against them, which I believe tells you everything you need to know about the kind of person. You know, how little oppression they have actually experienced in their lives that they would mm-hmm. think, having to think about the consequences of their words and the way in which they use their influence is equivalent to what gay people and trans people and people of color and disabled people have lived with their entire lives. It, it okay, so Michael, Michael is nodding. Michael is nodding really hard. So I'm, I'm thinking that like, he should come. <laughs> I should finish. I'll rant forever, otherwise. <laughs> I mean, it, it was just average nodding. To be to be fair, I was it's just general appreciation. All right. <laughs> but I think I think I think I mean I mean Carrie Ann is is completely right in what she says. Um, however, I disagree with the notion that it does affect other groups more than other than other groups. I think that actually disinformation and and fake news, if you like, or, and and, um, misinformation can affect anyone. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know if it affects one group or another, you know, empirically. But like, I would suggest that these tools can manipulate anyone. They can manipulate the smartest people in the world. They can manipulate the the, the less smartest people in the world. You can have someone who's a astronaut or an astrophysicist, and they are just as susceptible to disinformation of fake news as a normal person, uh, someone who does a regular job. So. I just I, like I, I, I think it is so powerful and so well constructed and the very mm-hmm. nature of disinformation means it's targeting individuals based on their own fears and weaknesses. It is designed and amended and revised to be effective to whatever group it's targeting. So I would I would suggest that actually, no, it can affect anyone at any time all ranges of personalities. Um, but Carrie Ann is spot on in the way she's describing how people can respond to it. Some people can respond to it a lot more comfortably than others, and that's absolutely true. Um, can I add Does something? Matt have, yeah, yeah. yeah, I was going to say. Um, I'd agree with Michael that anyone, and I think probably Carrie Ann would agree, that anyone can obviously be uh, targeted by fake news. I think <laughs> by far the most brainwashed um, and uh, fake news ingrained people in our society are our elites because they are the ones that the propaganda system and the power system invests a lot of resources into um, parroting all the bullshit um, narratives which support uh, the establishment, because they're the ones that are the newspaper columnists, they're the ones that are important in cultural institutions, they're the ones that will be in positions that will keep the bullshit going. So a lot of the resources are put into them. Obviously, they have to keep the uh, hoi polloi indoctrinated too, but to a lesser extent, you can, you got the sun for that. You know what I mean? Most of the higher educational institutions like the universities, the think tanks, they're all focused on programming the elite to believe all the lies that, that legitimate Western power, essentially, and, and, and British establishment power. It's quite interesting. There's obviously always this debate about do they believe, believe the, their own propaganda or are they actively um, uh, just bullsh- uh, bullshitting to the population to keep them uh, under control. I actually think that most of them believe their own bullshit because they have to, to really carry on with their lives. If you if you talk to elite people, <clears throat> whether that be in think tanks or, or government, and I worked for the Financial Times in, in Washington, D.C., and most of the people I spoke to, nearly all of them, parroted the bullshit American exceptionalist line about America being a force for good and spreading freedom and democracy. I think that they all believed it because you can't really go through life like consciously bullshitting everyone so and and it's much easier you're a much better liar if you believe the lies so that's my take on that i think just to go back to the identity stuff about um uh uh, uh, i I think it has an important 
uh, impact in terms of reputation because the traditional how how British culture traditionally sees sophistication and respectability is a posh white man in a suit, right? So if you're saying things that are completely against the grain, which we do in alternative media, because we, we, we seek the truth and we seek to hold power to account, it's much harder to do that if number one, you're going against the grain and you don't look like those traditional arbiters of truth and respectability. So actually the canary, another reason why they are attacked so much as well, I believe, is because they are one of the few institutions which uh, brings up working class journalists who have accents uh, people of colour who you just don't see in the traditional newsroom. So not only are they taking on the establishment, but they don't look like the establishment. And, and obviously they hate all that. So I think it's much easier for people like me to say outrageous, well, what they see as outrageous things, but I believe that, well, they are truthful, but it's easier for me because I'm a white guy, right? Whereas, uh, and, and I think that that's, um, that's important for us to understand that there is a, a form of privilege and it's much easier for us to, to get away with that. Although it's not, I mean, again, the system doesn't want people like me either, but um, but um, it has it has an important impact in that sense. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you for responding to that question. Um, I think we've taken a lot from that. Uh, we're going to be going into a Q&A very shortly, but uh, thank you so much, panelists, for answering all my questions. Um, keep your questions coming wherever you're, you're, you're watching us from. And the first question, Matt, I think you've just taken some water because the first question I'm going to ask is actually for you. <laughs> um, so this follows on from your uh, from from the term of independent media. So the term independent media is pushed as an idealist alternative to traditional or big media companies with right or left agendas. But doesn't all media reporting have an agenda? Yes. In a word, yes, but my agenda and what I believe the agenda of anyone should be is to hold power to account. Now, I, I don't see that as a political thing. I don't see it. If Jeremy Corbyn had won and his government was overseeing uh, GCHQ, which was doing awful things, I'd report that and investigate that because they're in power. I believe that the, the, the dichotomy we should think of is the dichotomy between the journalist and power, not between the left and the right, or et cetera, et cetera. So I think that all media has an agenda, but having an agenda against power is healthy and is actually how journalism should be because states and corporations lie habitually. In some ways, they're set up to lie habitually. So without a journalist or press corps that sees its role as trying to sift through all the bullshit and find the truth, you ain't going to get any truth. And that's why we don't have any, because most of the journalists we have in the mainstream, nearly all of them, don't really see their role as as um, taking on power. They actually are the most partisan hacks you can get. Most of them are either Labour or Tory. They, they want to get they, they, they want to attack the, the other side. I mean, a good example of that is all the shit now you see about Boris Johnson. Right. Which is great. I mean, I don't I don't mind seeing him getting a kick in. Right. But a lot of these people, they all support Tony Blair. Now, if you're looking for swamp creatures, Objectively, Tony Blair's a lot worse than Boris Johnson, but they wouldn't touch Tony Blair. So, so, it's, so I would take both of them on, and that's what journalists should do. They should be taking on power, whoever wields it, because power lies, and we're there to to correct those lies. Thanks, Matt, and uh, thanks to Ola Fabbahan who actually gave us that question. Uh, the next question, any of you can take this one. What are your thoughts regarding the alliance between right-wing propagandists and more liberal people, particularly in the wellness or spirituality world? And this is from Joudois Parfait. Anyone want to take that one? Michael? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I can try it. So well, what, can you just refresh the, uh, the question again? <clears throat> so it was a wellness or something to do with wellness? Yeah, so, so it says, what are your thoughts regarding the alliance between right-wing propagandists and more liberal people, particularly in the wellness spirituality world? I mean, I don't know a huge amount about the wellness and spirituality world, being being an atheist um, and uh, just a geeky tech guy, basically. So I have time to, to find my humanity. Um, but I think that if there is a link with right-wing propagandists and sort of liberal journalism, um, I think it's disgusting. Um, I think there's far too many people who are often uh, re-platformed or forgiven um, in our society who have done 
terrible things and have lied and they cheated and then go on to host um, breakfast news shows or, or, or lie in war, dossier, in war dossiers and then end up um, back on those same shows and completely rehabilitated. I think that's a massive problem. Um, I think um, so-called liberals who work with right-wing propagandists, I mean, they, they are, you know, they're part of the problem. They're actually furthering the propaganda of these right-wing outlets and these individuals. And, I, and, you know, if they're doing it as part of some sort of patriotic reason, um, I think it's completely madness and, and, and we need to put an end to it immediately. Yeah. Uh, Kerry ann you wanted to say something there. You were waving. Yeah, I, th I, I think I kind of know where the question's coming from. And it's something that I've been kind of watching... God, it's a better part of 20 years now. I don't want to date myself too much. But but the first time it happened to me, um, I encountered a group of middle-class students, all of whom were white and all of whom grew up in a city, who had just returned from a gap year trip to Uganda, um, where they were supposed to be teaching farmers um, how to get the most from their land. And um, I happen to be autistic, so I'm prone to asking direct questions, <laughs> which perhaps other people do. But sort of, I was quite confused. I was like, so were you guys farmers? No. Like, did you, like, are you studying farming? Have you spent much time in Uganda? How are you, I don't understand the, te the process of learning here, going from you to people who are in Uganda, and I assume actually farmers, and it's that kind of mind for me. I feel like I keep bumping into these people all of the time where they sort of have this like white saviour complex, um, which kind of neatly, I think, dovetails into that English exceptionalism, American exceptionalism, the idea that we are at the very forefront of human progress um, and this benevolent force upon the world. And so we should go and help these poor savages, you know, over there. And basically what it ends up turning into, actually, is a sort of poverty safari, um, which makes them feel great. It goes on their CV um, and helps them get into a better university or, you know, whatever. They create these little networks. And then in probably about 10 years time, they end up running an NGO in exactly the same way, um, which is basically just a wealth extraction program. Um, and jobs for the boys are never actually really making a great dent on the issue at hand because that would be a debt jubilee <laughs> because that's one of the principal ways actually we can help the so-called developing world is to take our boot off their neck um, it's not about charity it's about stopping active harm um, that, that we're doing in those countries whether it's illegal wars or you know or the, you know the financialization to death of these economies um, mm -hmm. So that's a big issue. And I think what happens is there is this liberalism is now is completely interwoven into capitalism as if as if these are intrinsically kind of symbiotic things. And wherever we expand capitalism, we expand liberalism and all of this good stuff. And that has become more and more toxic throughout my lifetime. You know, it started bad, but it is continuing to get worse and you've now got i was looking on social media the other day and there's this sort of tiktok instagram kind of culture thing where um this group had set up this wellness center and i can't remember where it was but you know guatemala, foreign. <laughs> so yeah I can't remember. And there yes, was guatemala. This guatemala and you yeah. looked at this picture it was all white people you know where they were being served by Brown people. <laughs> That's the only brown people there reserving them. And I really then, want to be on the other side of this conversation today. This is really know, right. <laughs> it is, and it was crazy to me. And they're getting recommended all over social media. Like, look at these amazing, all oh, this lifestyle. This you know, we need to learn to take a step back from the chaos of existence and just be. And it's like, yeah, if you've got a couple of million in the bank and you're white, and you know. This is just an invasion. Like this is literally, they've just invaded this country, set up these wellness centers that none of the indigenous population are going to be able to, to attend. To um, access, yeah. yeah, to make themselves feel better. And the worst thing about it for me is that wellness is actually really important. And I think it's most important to those of us with the least and those of us on the front line and all of, the, and all of that stuff. And because so much of the language of self-care and wellness has been co-opted 
by this kind of wealthy liberal elite, it means that uh, it just means that it, it's kind of bastardized and ruined for those people who who most need it. And uh, some of the work I'm doing now, even internally at the Canary, is about kind of taking those words and kind of shredding all of that crap away from them and just mm-hmm. saying, look, you know, we ha- we have a body and a body mind system going on here, and it's really important that we take care of of both of them to the best of our abilities. And there are lots of different scales that you can do that at, regardless of your income. Um, and, and I, I mean, uh, just, uh, it's important to add to that Guatemala story, because I did see that advert as well, is that <laughs> there was a, um, a lot of them were Americans, right? And there was a, a, a coup in Guatemala, the country they're all in, having doing their wellness stuff. There was a coup there in 1954, where, because a, a CIA coup, uh, because the democratically elected government had the temerity to uh, redistribute a little bit of land to fallow land to peasants. Uh, and that pissed off the United Fruit Company, uh, which was uh, run by one of the Dulles brothers. The other du- brother was head of the CIA. And they just took out democracy. That 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 unleashed a about five decades of, of the, one of the worst civil wars of the period uh, and the genocide, 200,000 indigenous people were killed in like Nazi-like tactics. Clinton actually eventually apologized, which is rare for the US, for what the US had done in Guatemala. So that's the context. And then you have these people prancing around like twats uh, uh, who have no idea that they're, they're in a society which their government and their way of life has destroyed. Uh, literally, it's a destroyed society that has these little pockets of affluence now. So and I, I, just to go back to what Kerry Ann said and, and, and the question itself, I think it's important to understand that everything that anyone creates in our society is liable to get co-opted uh, and assimilated by corporate power because that is what our, the, the biggest story of our time and our politics is corporate power, right? And another element of that is identity politics. Like Carrie Ann says, wellness is very important. Obviously, identity politics, if practiced in the right way or practiced with, with awareness of other contexts, is it very important and a, a very important lens through which to see society. But it's been massively co-opted by corporations and particularly liberal corporate friendly political forces to kind of stuck, destroy the left in many ways because they, they, they have moved the conversation. It's not about certain identity politics not being important it's just about prioritization it's now that corporations love everyone focusing solely on identity and decontextualizing it from economic issues social issues whereas and that's that's because it's corporate friendly um in in a sense like a a, a ceo uh, doesn't really care if gay rights gets uh, if there's gay rights in his society or not they're, they're, he's quite willing to give that he'd be much more concerned if they were going to put taxes up on corporations you know what i mean that's in the corporate world that's what they really care about and i think that's why in the us you see such a focus on the sort of cultural issues like abortion and uh, gay rights and all that stuff because that whole political system is controlled in a in, to a degree that even not here by corporations so those kind of priorities reflect that. So the wellness thing, as Kerry Ann said, is obviously it's important. But but everything. I mean, Herbert Marcuse, the the, the he was popular in the sixties uh, amongst all the radicals. He he came up with this term repressive tolerance, where uh, the system will will tolerate something but gut it of its of its meaning. And uh, and we yeah. see it all the time. I mean, Che Guevara on T-shirts where people don't even know who he is. That's the obvious example, but it goes for everything. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Matt. Um, I think we've really exhausted that one. Really appreciate all your, your input into that. Michael, um, there's a question for you. Can we use technology to validate what is true and not? Blockchain reporting? Um, I mean, you can use technology to help you discover something that may be a, a sensationalized story, something that may be fake news. But ultimately, like blockchain itself is a store of data, an immutable store of data. So when data is stored on the blockchain, it is as it was. It cannot be manipulated after the fact. Um, and that's really important um, when people try and change what they wrote previously. A prime example of that would be Dominic Cummings changing his blog. I think it was in December last year where he alluded to the fact that he had been talking about COVID 
this whole time. Um, and he, he, he added it to his blog. Um, and then, um, thanks God, some studious journalists figured it out by the Wayback Machine and were able to discover the original, the original posting. So you couldn't do that on the blockchain. Um, so that, that's one way to approach it. But the blockchain or algorithms or artificial intelligence, it can't like detect what's true or not these things are like we were discussing earlier they are subjective they are opinionated they are based on people's mediated version of events and you know when you when you when you remember something you remember the last time you remembered it not necessarily the last moment you remembered it um so we can be our own worst enemies with our own memories um and that can influence how we tell a story um so there's no way technology could understand that that your interpretation of it was based upon your own per, your own um, perception of reality rather than you know a kind of cold set of empirical facts so technology can help it can help shine a light on things but ultimately truth cannot be just flagged as yes or no because it is an absolute mm -hmm. it, it, it is an arbitrary either so so no it is the answer but it can help it can help massively Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, Matt, I've got a question for you here. I don't think I see who asked it, but it says, um, under what circumstances would it make sense for the establishment to publish information about their behavior, for example, Oman, et cetera? <laughs> never. Uh, never makes sense on there in the way they think of things. Um, I mean, they. it's funny, isn't it? Because they they do leak a lot of stuff the establishment in terms of but it's all to, to fit a narrative that they want to put out and effectively that works very well for them if someone comes along and leaks information which kind of uh contradicts what what what, what their messaging then you see what happens in western democracy snowden would have been put in a prison uh in in the colorado supermax for the rest of his life out in the desert assange is two years uh in belmarsh a decade basically confined uh to a room uh these these are people that have merely done journal well, well one's a whistleblower but assange is a, is a journalist and i think um his case shows it kind of answers the question right what under what circumstances they they don't want any information published which 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 upsets their ability to project power and that's what this is about and it's important to understand that us in independent media, we're part of what they call an information war. They see in the information age when you can get, when we can, the, 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 the means of intellectual production are not owned by what well, they still are in terms of the major uh, outlets that they're, they're owned by corporations. But before that was all there was. And now the new technologies have allowed people who don't have any kind of means to put their messaging out. And that, uh, and also, at the same time, the technology has allowed large amounts of data to be released uh, at once globally. So that poses a massive threat to Western power. I mean, it poses a threat to, to every power, uh, every state. So in that context, they see, that's why they call this, they, they call now, I mean, um, we're part of this, they, they, they call it the grey zone, right? There's this area where, which is murky, where it's about information war, hybrid war, and journalists who are doing stuff which isn't just regurgitating their propaganda, which is the mainstream they've got, they, they don't worry about them, they, they see them as a threat. Um, mm. So they will never release information that they, that, they don't, that, they, that they think will be damaging. And the funny thing is, I mean, a good example of that is recently, <clears throat> Kerry referred to John McAvoy's stuff on Venezuela. I've done a couple of pieces with him for, for Declassified as well, which have also had quite a big impact in Venezuela. And I recently did one on, on Bolivia, which mm -hmm. had a, a, a massive impact as well. The, the, the ambassador got called in and stuff like that. That was all done from Freedom of Information Act requests. And since that Bolivia story, the Foreign Office has just never stopped giving me any information. They've stopped, which is illegal or unlawful. Uh, and I'm currently working on a story on that. But that just shows that if, if, you, if you use the information in a way that isn't conducive to what they see as projecting power, then then they they will stop releasing it to you. And if, mm -hmm. if sorry, I, I, and just to finish, and WikiLeaks right was created as a uh, an intelligence agency of the people. It was going to be a well, it is a repository of information. The U.S. government, in alliance with the U.K. government, spent a decade trying to destroy it, and has effectively destroyed it now. That uh, WikiLeaks doesn't really do much now. And that shows you their attitude towards journalism, 
which genuinely challenges power. They love going around the world and using their brand of a, a, a promoting a free press because the free press works for them most of the time. If people push the edges of what of 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 what we what we think of as the free press, then you you'll see what happens to them. They they end up in Belmarsh. So yes. um, yeah. Right. Thank, thanks a lot, Matt. Uh, lots to unpack there. Carrie Ann, you wanted to come in at some point, or can can we move on to the next question? Um, very, very quickly. I just wanted to say, you know, it's even even if we look at some some actors who have been establishment media journalists who have had to leave that space in order to do their jobs. You know, and I just just off the top of my head, two examples. One would be Peter Oborn, who was at the Telegraph. HSBC are a massive sponsor of the Telegraph. He wasn't able to publish stories about HSBC, which involve serious levels of, of corruption. But essentially, HSBC is like the money launderer of the world. Um, he was unable to report it. He left. You know, and then, you know, even recently, this has gone on years now, they've been punishing Peter O'Born for this. You know, recently he releases a book, not one review in the establishment press, not one. Like, they have basically acted... Um, and he is continuing to do fan fantastic work. And me and Peter O'Brien do not share politics. But I recognise, OK, we don't share politics, but we do share a passion for journalism and a passion for truth. Um, and he has my respect on, on that count. And there's also Nafiz Ahmed, um, who, again, you know, kind of because of the stuff he was writing, lost his Guardian um, column and his position as a contributor there. And this stuff just kind of goes on. So there are these horror stories that happen every now and again, which I think help keep establishment media journalists in line. They know what the invisible lines are. They know where those lines are. They know how closely they can come up to it and keep their job and keep their little chair on news night and all that stuff. And largely, overwhelmingly, um, they oblige and, and comply. And those who don't are, are normally punished. So if you've if you've ever seen an investigation come out and that journalist wasn't punished, someone powerful wanted that investigation to come out. Mm. Often you're just dealing with a bun fight between two Etonians. You know, it's literally as simple as that. This guy rings his friendly journalist, you know, leaks something, and then the other guy rings his his friendly journalist, and that's how this whole system operates. It's like grace and favors all all the way through. Um, and yeah, you know, the rest of us who are trying to actually you know, do journalism are, are vilified. It's crazy. Thanks. Thanks for those insights. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at the time now, so I need to rush with this one. Uh, do scientific truth and poetic truth have equal status or value in your opinion, Michael? This is from Alison Teal. Um, yes. Mm. <laughs> it's a great question. Um, I, I won't be that sure, but I mean, yeah, I mean, of course they do. I mean, you know, poetic um, um, a truth is like is is our existence as humans. It's who we are. It's our emotions. It's, it's our very soul, if you like. Um, and and scientific empirical evidence is 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 the world, right? It's how one generation learns from the next generation. If we didn't have that, then we'd have to learn stuff all over again. And actually, one of the problems with the um, with the breakdown of shared truth is the fact that people can now challenge things that have already been established. Like, for example, is the world flat? Uh, or do vaccines contain bots and things like that? And I think that, I think that's, that's ultimately very problematic as well. Um, but sorry, what was the question again? I went on off a bit of a tangent there. <laughs> so remind me of the question, Chiwa, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, do scientific truth and poetic oh, right, yeah, truth sorry. have equal status? Yeah, so I think I think they do, but I, I don't think they exist in news. And I think I think that's the, like what I was saying earlier. I think that's the biggest problem because news is both scientific and emotions mixed together. But ultimately, yeah, of course, they're definitely both as important as each other. But they should not be conflated, and they should be handled different. And they both have different um, opportunities and, and different preferences uh, when they're used. Um, so if they're just used, you know, you can't just push them together. You can't conflate them. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Carrie Ann, you wanted to come in there. Go ahead. Yeah, just very quickly, I wanted to give an example of how we would do that practically. So uh, in a newsroom. So what we have is um, there's a little layer in an image that goes on the front of all of our articles. And it's a, it's a category. And so the category would be news. And if a story is news, we make it as news voice as possible. So very little editorialising. Um, these are the facts. End of, end of the story. 
And then you go right across the sort of two in between, but then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got opinion. Um, and we treat those very, very differently. And it's very important to us that we tell our readers, this is you reading somebody's opinion. It can be an informed opinion. You know, it, it you know, it's not like you get to show facts because it's, a, it's an opinion piece. But you, what you're saying is, as we all know, if you're putting forward an argument and a, based on opinion, um, then it's likely to include less of the opponent's argument. You know, it's and, and you want to be clear. And I think that's a really important thing to do because what what you know many of us have, uh, would know as as kind of people in the media is a lot of outlets that claim to be objective, and they'll have a news voice. The thing you're reading is written in, in news voice, so it comes across as very objective and impartial. Is riddled with bias. You know, from the choice of the picture. Um, that, that's being used at, at the top. For example, there'll be a picture that's actually detailing an Israeli attack on Palestinians, and the picture will be Palestinians from stones. You know, so it's like you're set up going into this story to see actually the Palestinians as as the violent party in this. So already you are sort of sympathising with the Israeli side, you know, and then there'll just be a string of factual errors. I'm being generous. <laughs> all the way through so that in the end actually that news voice that performative impartiality is actually dangerous it's actually been weaponized in service of what is actually an opinion piece what is actually a piece of propaganda designed to make you feel a certain way and so i think you know one of the ideas i've had is that we you know critical thinking is like the number one skill that we need to be enhancing like across the population. I would have critical thinking lessons running in food banks. I'm not even joking. You know, mm. all over the place, everywhere that we could have these things, like adult education for critical thinking, because I think once you have a, set, a clear set of critical thinking skills, um, mm -hmm. you can, you have much greater control over how you consume news. And it doesn't matter who you're going to read, whether it's the Canary or the Times or wherever. We're all going to have biases that impact the way that, that we report things. And I think as a consumer of news, what I try to do is go for a breadth of sources, get as many primary sources as possible. But you have to know how to access those. And you have to know how to read them um, yeah. to, to sort of form an opinion. And I would really love to see more of that happening in our education system from reception class up. You could be doing okay. this with five year Carrie Ann, I'm going to have to stop you so I can just Sorry. go switch. And thanks a lot for that. Um, and, and here's one around biases. So to our white members of the panel, what actionable steps do you take to address your and your white colleagues' whiteness and white biases in your work? I'll let Michael go with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I mean, I, I so I, I, I guess I take a little bit of issue with this, just in the sense that the notion of this, the, this formidable, this, this white male. I mean, I'm, I'm half Irish, half Egyptian. Um, I, I had to change my name at seven years old because I was getting a sea of racist abuse, uh, and I'm the perception of white. Uh, my dad was uh, from Egypt and was a, and is a Muslim, um, so that cause a lot of problems for me growing up so i don't really perceive myself as as a white person with with all the with all the tra trappings uh in the traditional sense but that's you know ultimately I, there is a privilege because other people see me that way so it's kind of doesn't really matter how how i see others but in relation to to directly to the question i mean it doesn't matter to us um about any of that really i mean the first thing we look at is someone's writing skills whether it be their writing of code or their writing of um of of, of content of news articles um and we'll receive that and that's what we'll review um i guess it's really difficult i mean there always is an an inherent bias i guess with every individual to a certain degree um so i mean our our, our team is 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 somewhat diverse but i guess the problem it was 10 of us i guess, I guess five of us are white males um so um and, and so that is probably problematic and that's probably an un un think, un unconscious bias as well okay yeah so so i think maybe maybe the um uh, yeah I, I just wanted to bring back that aspect of white bias yeah. in your work so maybe not necessarily uh I mean, like I'm the way we sure report that, things 
the way we were yeah, yeah. I, 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 I mean i i kind of reject that that concept i have to say uh i don't think it's a lens through which uh, which is a useful way to view reporting uh because it's more about power what's your attitude to power you can have different races people of different um sexualities all through the power system that are susceptible to the same um ways of co-opting them into writing whatever it is that the establishment wants so i don't really think uh why in terms of the reporting itself i don't see a a, a color-based bias i think that the, uh, uh, the, the bias or the privilege that i have is based on what i mentioned earlier which is just i look like a traditional um uk uh, like respected journalist so i have that benefit i'm aware of that um and definitely i think that going back to what carrie Ann was saying earlier i think that it is one of the major ways of reforming um the media and, and making it more truthful is to make it uh, reflect society because it's all the, the the craft of journalism or the or the trade has all as well it wasn't always but since the 60s or so has been the preserve of posh white men um and it that that is part of the reason it's so structurally tied to the establishment and so structurally tied to entrenched power so that's got to change and with that it will become a more truthful media but i actually don't think in terms of my reporting i have a white bias uh my i, I just I, I genuinely don't so i can't really answer that question and i i think it's actually an, an unhelpful way of understanding what people are writing i think a much more helpful way in terms of the media is to understand the structural forces at play where does that person sit within the power structure how is that power how is where how are those structural forces impacting their reporting rather than how, how is their color of their skin impacting it okay uh, let me uh, let me bring in kerian uh yeah kerian go ahead yeah just quick sorry i'm conscious we've not got much time yeah. left so i'll try and pray this but um one of the challenges that i've actually had with this is and, and i would say it's very, it's very difficult to appreciate your own bias. Um, I have a white bias because I live in a society which centers white people. So even though I'm a person of color, I have a white bias. So if someone says, think of a doctor, what is the first thing that I see in my head? I see a white man in a coat with a little stethoscope around his neck. Why? Because... In our media, we present doctors often as, well, when I was growing up, it was a white guy with a white coat and a little stethoscope around his neck. Um, and there are all of these little ways and little insidious ways in which these biases creep in that, do, that really do have an impact on the way you approach a story, the per types of people that you would go to for comment, um, the image, even the featured image that we'd use, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's almost 99% white people. And all of this kind of works in a sort of very subtle but very real way to, to create and reinforce those biases that are inevitable in a, in a society which is kind of as endemically racist as the one that we all kind of, I assume, grew up in. Um, and so yes. I'm, Carrie, to I'm going to ask that we yeah, end sorry. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but really, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Michael Bywire, Matt Kennard, Declassified UK, Kerry Ann Mendoza, The Canary. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. This is the Festival of Debate. Lots more activities if you go to the Festival of Debate uh, website and um, right through to the end of the month. So thank you again for joining us and good night.